Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Digital Frontier of Parkinson's Research, Advancing a New Age of Clinical Discovery. Uh, I'm Miles Skoda, editor for Life Science Connect, and again, thanks for joining us. So Parkinson's research is evolving with a dramatic increase in patient involvement, advanced systems of measurement, and real-world data gathering at the forefront. Subjective assessments and endpoints can now be augmented with richer data sources gathered directly via wearables, sensors, and mobile technology. Beyond enabling data collection outside the clinic, these models tied to existing gold standard measurements enhance all stakeholders' abilities to access more sensitive, frequent, and objective measures of Parkinson's progression. So with this in mind, we've brought in two experts at the forefront of this research. Dr. Josh Cosman, Director of Digital Health Strategy at AbbVie, and Dr. David Anderson, Senior Scientist at Clinical Inc., to discuss the current landscape of Parkinson's clinical trials, uh, look at historical perspectives of the Parkinson's patient experience, to look at wearables, sensors, and remote trials, and explore opportunities for further digital growth in Parkinson's disease research. Um, in addition, we'll be holding a live Q&A session following this presentation. Feel free to submit questions as we go along. Any that we don't get to during the live Q&A will follow up on after the event. Um, just a couple housekeeping notes. If you run into any issues, please try refreshing your browser first. If that doesn't work, submit a question via the Q&A, and I'll help get you back on track. And finally, this webinar will be available on demand, normally about after 24 hours, and you'll get an email with the link. Uh, with all that said, I'm going to turn it over to Josh and David to get us started. All right, thank you, Miles. Um, welcome, everyone, to this Clinical Leader Series um, hosted by Clinical Inc. Today's webinar is focusing on the digital frontier of Parkinson's research, advancing a new age of clinical discovery. We're really delighted to host this webinar um, during and in service of Parkinson's Awareness Month, which is happening during the entire month of April. So our industry expert joining us today is Dr. Josh Cosman. Josh, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. I can take a stab at that. Uh, so my name is Josh Cosman. I am currently a director of digital health strategy at AbbVie. I support our neuroscience portfolio in the digital space. Uh, I guess just by way of background, um, by training, I'm a cognitive and clinical neuroscientist. So I've spent time studying cognition, studying behavior, movement, a lot of the things that we now consider to be digital uh, were things that, that we were studying in a lab-based setting quite a while ago, I mean, decades ago at this point. Um, so I guess that's that's the short of it. Um, and David, if you'd like, you could you could introduce yourself as well. Sure. Yep, David Anderson, Senior Scientist at Clinical Inc. I'm a visual cognitive neuroscientist by training in education with previous academic appointments in neurology and ophthalmology. At Clinical Inc., I'm working with a multidisciplinary disciplinary team of scientists and engineers working on integrating data from multiple sensors and assessments, um, generating uh, feature engineering pipelines uh, from those data sources, um, and evaluating scale scalable and machine learning algorithms to develop digital biomarkers of disease states and remotely monitored, monitored clinical trials. So Josh, today we're talking about Parkinson's disease. From your perspective, what can you tell us about the prevalence and clinical features of Parkinson's? So I guess you know, briefly, Parkinson's is the second most common uh, neurodegenerative disorder. It's actually on the rise. So this is something that one of my colleagues really you know, talks about a lot. Um, in terms of the presentation, as you see here, this is a pretty common figure. You see this in a lot of presentations, papers. Um, the, the basically, when, where, where we're typically concerned at this point is around the early stage PDs, when, when a patient actually has a diagnosis. And how PD is typically diagnosed, and I think it's an important thing to point out, is that it is, is a disease that is diagnosed through functional assessment. Whereas other disorders, I mean, oftentimes outside of neurology, neuroscience, psychiatry, are diagnosed possibly with biological markers, um, physiological markers. We don't really have those same diagnostics for PD. And so what will typically happen is patients will present with a set of key signs or symptoms. And those typically fall into the domains of bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor. And essentially, having two of those three would, would essentially say that that patient is likely to have Parkinson's disease. So as you can see here, bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor, because of their, their diagnostic status, occur right at that transition of early stage PDS. That's when a patient is first diagnosed. But as you can see in this figure, 
a number of non-motor symptoms in particular precede that, possibly by decades. And so I think a lot of work has been focused on, in addition to detecting early motor signs of PD, going back in time and examining some of these non-motor factors to see if they may be able to provide, a, I guess, a better diagnostic or a better gauge of possible Parkinson's symptoms well before they occur. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a multifactorial disease. Um, it's not just motor uh, components to it that are uh, kind of typically considered in, in this disease. Um, so AbbVie is continuing to invest in novel therapeutic discovery and development for patients living with Parkinson's disease. Can you tell us what the current landscape is for the therapeutic options in this area? Yeah, sure, I can. Um, this, so again, this is a pretty common figure, and this is something that actually gets it's redone frequently. So, so yearly, there's, you take stock of what the, the current pipelines are, of therapeutic agents that, that are coming down the pike for Parkinson's disease, and they can be subdivided into symptomatic therapies, which are really there to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, and on the other hand, there are disease-modifying therapies, and I think a place where a lot of work is focused in more recent years, where what we are actually trying to do is target the pathology of the disease to slow the course or stop the course. So instead of just covering the symptoms, you may fundamentally change the course of the disease. And as you can imagine, if you can find patients early enough in the process, in the in sort of you know, this, as, as things unfold over time, the earlier that you can possibly treat with a disease-modifying agent, the more likely it would be to have long-term benefit for those patients. So I think that the main takeaway is there have been reasonable and increasingly good symptomatic therapies for quite a while in Parkinson's disease. But what we've really tried to focus on now is disease-modifying therapies that could actually change the course and give many good years back to patients relative to what they experience now. Sure. And when you say change the course, um, can you expand on kind of what you're looking at, what kind of features you're looking at in changing the course of, of this disease? Well, it could be a number of features of Parkinson's disease. So if you just take the one of the, the current clinical scales that's used to assess Parkinson's disease, and going back to that slide, you know, the last slide, it's, it's a holistic assessment. And, and what you might imagine is that in the case of a symptomatic, some symptomatics may have relatively targeted effects. So, for example, you could have a symptomatic that's targeting certain circuits in the brain that are involved in cognitive function with the hope of bringing back cognitive function in a person with Parkinson's who's, who's lost or, or is experiencing some decline. On the other hand, with a disease-modifying therapy, you're sort of hitting it at the base. So you're, you're trying to target the pathology. And exactly where those changes or the slowing of the course may manifest at this point is really unknown. I mean, things will, will progress at different rates, and we know that from natural history studies. But to date, there haven't been successful disease-modifying trials that would let us understand whether some features of Parkinson's are more amenable to, to modification than others. And there's, um, in the clinic, uh, there's typically like some sort of assessment that's involved in, in determining kind of the severity of the disease um, called the UPDRS. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Yep. So in, in brief, for the MBS UPDRS, which I actually think is, is really a pretty good clinical scale in the context of clinical scales that we have for neurology, I mean, historically speaking, a lot of times have been put into developing this. There's, there's four components to this. Three are most critical early in the, the disease course where, where we may be applying these disease-modifying agents. So the, the MDS UPDRS part one gets at non-motor experiences of daily living, um, and there are, are, are both clinician interview and patient reported elements to that. And again, in part two, it's the same, the same sort of approach, but in this case, you're focused on motor experiences of daily living. So this really gets at what a patient's experience is in their daily life and the impact of their Parkinson's disease. Part three is, uh, is focused on motor examination. So a trained clinician will have patients go through a set of primitive motor tasks, not unlike what you see sort of on the right side of the screen here. You have a man holding his arms out in, in sort of a, a upright posture. And through the course of assessing and in, in pretty granular detail across different body regions, uh, an, an individual with Parkinson's will be asked to complete these tests while a clinician watches them and rates them on a, on a zero to four scale. Zero being an absence of that feature and four being most severe. All right. Thank you. So um, as patients come in to clinic, be inv are involved in clinical trials, it's uh, really a uh, quite an extensive process uh, that involves a lot of time and effort from patients, clinicians, researchers, 
Um, do you want to give an idea of like what a patient can experience when they're participating in clinical trials in, in Parkinson's disease? Well, I mean, what, what I would say is it would be very difficult for me to do that because I am not a person with Parkinson's and I have not participated directly in a clinical trial. I can tell you how we, we design our trials, but I don't think that's that's exactly what you'd want to hear. So I, what I don't want to do is speak for a, a person living with Parkinson's who comes to participate in our trials. But what I will tell you is that increasingly we're trying to, to decrease how much those people have to actually do when they come to the clinic and trying to find ways to make it, I guess, a, a more pleasant or better experience for them, given that, and especially when we're looking at disease modification, there are cases where we may try to blanket everything because to the point that I made earlier, we don't really know where we might see an effect and we don't want to leave something on the table. And so we may have a number of assessments that, that would go beyond what you might see in a symptomatic trial, but it's trying to balance that with, with trying to, to take a little bit of burden off of a person with Parkinson's because it, it really, it's a huge ask to have them to come in to participate sometimes, many times in these disease modifying trials over the course of multiple years, coming multiple times per year, spending hours in the clinic. So I think, you know, what I would say is that it would be better told from a person with Parkinson's disease than me what the experience would be. But I can tell you that we are working to try and decrease the burden on the patients as they come to the clinic uh, to, to participate in our trials. That sounds great. Um, all right, so you've been a central figure in what uh, we've been referring to as the digital revolution of clinical trials. And this is obviously a, a concerted effort across multiple people that you've been involved in. Um, how would you describe the digital revolution and what makes it feasible in this space? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, to me, uh, it's, it's not like an abrupt revolution like it might seem. And we've been doing this kind of stuff in the lab for a really long time. I mean, I, I, I'm not that old, but I've been doing this for almost 20 years at this point. And there were people that have been doing objective recordings, you know, com completing objective tasks, using things like gate mats, even the kinds of accelerometers we use now in a more primitive form you know, decades ago. So, so I guess to me, it's been kind of a slow build. I think where Parkinson's is unique relative to some other neurological disorders or other diseases in, or in general, is that we, because of that history, I think we're at a point now where we're better positioned in Parkinson's to standardize some of these things. We understand them a lot better than we do in some other disease areas. And I think it's really the time to kind of start pulling things together. I mean, as with many academic fields, there have been de facto standards that have come about through years of doing this kind of work. And that's actually really beneficial to us because we're not starting from scratch, uh, you know, at the beginning of the digital re revolution, as you've said. Um, we're really able to draw on decades worth of work and at this point, it's trying to take what we know and have that be something that's scalable, that's useful in the context of our clinical trials, and, and really trying to optimize things that we've done for a really long time. Sure. Um, and so uh, this, you know, there's been some effort in getting uh, decentralized clinical trials kind of off the ground. COVID has had quite an effect on the clinical trial experience. Can you talk a bit about how Parkinson's research um, from your perspective has changed um, during COVID and how decentralized clinical trials are kind of emerging within this field? So, I mean, you're probably asking the wrong person in this case because I haven't participated or, or been part of any decentralized trials during COVID and, and really don't, I mean, what I will say about the impact, we, we have had ongoing studies where visits have had to have been missed, where there is missing data as a result of, of missing clinic visits, especially in, in something like, like Parkinson's disease, where there are physical aspects to the clinical examination. Not being there does cause some problems for us in terms of loss of data, things that we really can't get through something like telemedicine or, or a traditional decentralized approach. And, and this is one place where I see, at least in the future, digital tools being deployed remotely, being able to kind of fill that gap if we need it to be filled, because we could theoretically collect objective data on a number of the things that we actually care about, and, and I guess more robustly than we might be able to do through like MDS PDRS conducted through a televisit. Right. And um, how is the FDA responding to kind of these efforts that you've been involved in, uh, you know, generating new digital endpoints um, what kind of process is happening and going on behind, this, behind the scenes? So I can only speak to what I know about this, but, but I'll, I'll briefly mention the work that we've been doing with the Critical Path Institute and the Critical Path for Parkinson's in particular, where about three years ago we started an initiative called Digital Drug Development Tools that, that to the point that I made earlier, was really focused on, on us as industry sponsors alongside academics, regulatory bodies, really trying to take what, what I see as being relatively established 
measures that we've been doing for a very long time, but bringing those into a clinical trial setting to get maximum utility for them. And I think the important thing here is that through those type of consortia, there's, there's a dialogue between us and regulatory agencies, and, and FDA and EMA in particular have been very open to discussing with us paths forward for this. And I think oftentimes, you know, something that I hear a lot is that, that regulatory bodies will provide blockades to some of this novel work. And I would say it's completely the contrary. We're all learning about this. I mean, not everybody has been doing this work for decades. A lot of people are new to this. It's very new conceptually. A lot of the tools that we're using are new, and, and everybody's trying to learn together. So I think to the extent that we can do this in a pre-competitive manner where we draw on the expertise of everyone and kind of move forward together, I really see it being the only way that we can take things forward because the alternative is we're all going down different paths and doing different things. And that's really the opposite of what you, you need to have something that's robust and replicable and something that could actually facilitate therapeutic development. It's a very regulated setting, and, and you can imagine the kind of work that goes into standardizing things to be able to hit that, that high bar that we have to hit. And I think the only way that we can do it is, is through pre-competitive collaboration, openness with the science that we're doing, trying to be transparent and all learn together at the same time. Yep, definitely. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, you know, in academia, it's pretty common, too, to try and have some convergence in terms of methods so that everything's comparable across um, you know, different labs and things like that. So it makes sense that you want to do that in, in this setting as well. All right. So Clinical Inc. has been fortunate to work with you and other industry partners on ground floor efforts within Parkinson's research. Um, WatchPD is an exception, exceptional concept, um, an initiative to drive this field forward. So can you tell us broadly about WatchPD and how this study represents an important step forward um, in digital health? Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense to go back to what, what drove this this in the beginning. I mean, how did this study get started? And it was that, that there were, we, we were considering, we were working on disease-modifying assets in Parkinson's disease. And we knew from natural history work, you know, the PPMI in particular, uh, through the Michael J. Fox Foundation, that our current clinical scales in those early stages of PD that, that we would target with our with our disease-modifying therapies, they were not particularly sensitive to change in that population. And knowing that, we decided early on to try and do something better, and that was making a move to these digital tools that, that we, we understood relatively well, especially in the context of symptomatic medications, more advanced Parkinson's disease. But what we didn't understand was how those same types of measures could be used to track progression or or, or possibly diagnose patients in the earliest stages of the disease. So really the goal here was to take what we already knew, many of the things we already knew worked in more advanced populations or would be responsive to symptomatic therapies, and run a longitudinal study in early PD that looked almost exactly like a phase two proof of concept study for a disease modifying asset, and try to understand against the backdrop of, of clinical progression, so collecting data from a number of clinical scales, doing some imaging work, how the digital measures could track that progression and whether any of those measures in combination or in isolation could do a better job of tracking that progression or response to treatment than our current standard measures. Sure. And can you touch on kind of the players that were involved um, in this study? Well, yeah, so, so definitely. So, so conceptually, when we conceptualized this study, it was working with a great group of people at Pfizer and eventually this transitioned to, to Biogen. So Pfizer was sort of out of the neuroscience game at the time, but the idea was still important. So when we, when we moved to Biogen, um, this study, we got a lot of support. I mean, I would, I would really shout out Peter Bergathon for, for trying to pull this together. I mean, Peter, Bob Alexander at Takeda, uh, Jesse Cedarbaum at Biogen, they were sort of the ones that pulled this together to be something maybe a little bit more than it would have been if it was a single study at a single company. And it was from that that we, we struck up the partnership with the Critical Path Institute. And at that point, Watch PD became kind of a backbone of that 3DT effort that I mentioned previously. So there was a lot of, a lot of you know, intensive work at the beginning on the part of Biogen and Takeda, and even preceding that, a great group at Pfizer that really got this study off the ground. I mean, I've left out of this Rochester, but they're, they're really the backbone of the study. They did an amazing job of running it. They helped with conceptualizing all of this and have been great partners along the way. So from what, all of what I said, you, you notice I'm no longer at those companies, but, but I do still interact with this study. But right now it's still being carried on by, by folks at Biogen and Takeda alongside Rochester. Um, but my participation is now limited to work through the Critical Path Institute. 
Yeah, it's really awesome to see a, a large group of, of organizations working together to try and achieve this. And that kind of speaks to your discussion earlier um, where we have to kind of come to an agreement on a lot of the tools that are being used. So can you tell us about WatchBD study design and why some of the design choices were made to support this in a step, in a step forward? Yeah, so I mean, what, what you have here is really just the synopsis of, of what we included in this study. And, and as I mentioned before, it was really exploratory. So it, it's not like we just pulled tasks out of thin air. Again, we had a lot of work to draw on. So we understood some of the domains of, say, cognitive function that were impaired in people with Parkinson's disease. We understood some of the methods that have been used to collect data on things like cognition, speech, um, motor, motor, um, sorry, motor activity. And basically, we took what was already known and tried to put that into a form factor that was maybe a little easier to use or facilitate being able to collect data at scale. Because oftentimes, you know, at the time that, that, we out, that we went on to this study, a lot of these things weren't really in a, in a place where we could have done all of these multimodal measurements in any consolidated format. And, and probably if this would have been you know, six, seven, eight years ago, there really wouldn't have been any way that we could have collected this amount of data in such a streamlined fashion, especially outside of the clinic. Because as you can see, we collected data across really all of the main aspects of, of sort of signs and symptoms that would be experienced by people with Parkinson's in the early stage. And if we would have done this 10 years ago, we would have had to have multiple setups, probably in multiple rooms, and it really wouldn't have been feasible. It definitely would not have been feasible to collect this type of multimodal data outside of a clinic. So part of what we tried to do is take what we already knew, put it into a form factor that was more usable to be used outside of the clinic, in addition to just integrating these things into a single application versus having something that would have been unwieldy even in a clinic setting. And so these assessments were completed um, in the clinic uh, and also at home. Can you give a sense of kind of the granularity of these assessments were taken um, over time and how long patients were involved in this in this study? Yeah, so overall, this just for background, this this study was really modeled on the same the same patient population as was entered into the PPMI study. So these were patients that were within the first two years of diagnosis. We did DAT scan verification of PD to make sure that we were getting patients that were likely to have Parkinson's disease. Um, the way that the study was set up is we had a number of, of clinical scales, sort of the most common clinical scales that are used to assess both motor and non-motor aspects of PD. And um, we also included these other two digital components alongside of that. So one being the mobile battery at home that I just described, where patients were asked to complete that battery once every two weeks for their one year of participation. They also completed a clinic visit, an in-person visit in the clinic every three months with a one month visit inserted at the beginning just to make sure that since there was an at-home component, that if, any, if they had any questions or they weren't understanding what they were being asked to do at home, we'd catch that early on versus catching it at the three month visit or the six month visit, which at that point the ship will have sailed and, and we would have really been kind of stuck with what we had there. Um, and I guess the, the last thing to say is that, that currently there is a qualitative sub-study being run through the Critical Path Institute on the back end of this study where the participants are, are asked questions trying to understand first what aspects of their PD are most important or bothersome to them. And then in addition to that, trying to take from, from what they tell us, try to map that to the tasks that they completed in this particular study to understand whether the things that we're measuring here actually map to the things that patients might want to see modified by a treatment or things that they may actually want to measure versus loading them up with things that they don't see value in. Yeah, I can, that's a really interesting uh, study that you're, that you're, you're uh, describing. Um, it's pretty common uh, to kind of evaluate subjective versus objective assessments and determine kind of whether they relate to each other and it's not only relevant for PD but also for other diseases. So it's really exciting to see you doing that follow-up study to further examine that. Yeah. All right, so digital biomarker development is a trending topic in clinical science um, and data is the coin of the realm in this effort. But considerations across the entire data pipeline, including data collection, transfer, and analysis. What can you tell us about the data pipeline involved in developing these kinds of digital biomarkers and work that you've done? Well, yeah, I mean, it's basically, as you show here, at least with respect to, and, and I mean, this would be true even of, of some of the clinical tools. Um, so if you see here, I mean, you have the watch and, and phone activity, so this would be something that patients are completing at home. 
those data get transmitted automatically to a cloud server. And it looks like on, on your guys' side, you have a data lake, and that's that's pretty common pretty much anywhere. So once the data come in, you have somewhere where that data sits, and you can start to actually work through those data. And I think one thing to point out here that, that people don't always realize is that when we, we talk about signal processing, what that really means is that from, for, for example, we had a walking task as, as part of the, the Watch PD study, where we asked patients to put a phone in a pouch on their lower back, and we were really trying to le- replicate a lumbar sensor. So we know that from a lumbar sensor, we can get many bilateral features of gait function. And, and what's important to know is that it's a single continuous signal that comes from an accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer. And from that single continuous signal, we can drive through signal processing features that would allow us to say something more specific about, say, the biomechanics. So what are people's step lengths, their cadence, you know, how fast are they walking? Are patients more likely to shuffle? What is our arm range of motion? So from a single signal, we can oftentimes derive many different features, and I think that's sort of the, the tail end of what you have here. I think it's worth pointing out because it's it's not always clear you know, how, how do you go from a raw signal down to a feature itself, like arm swing or step length, and it's that key signal processing piece that's, that's really the important part. Yep. Um, so... That kind of is a nice segue into our next segment. And the way you describe feature engineering, uh, I think, is is a great context for what's happening here. Um, you know, you have to think critically about not only the signal that you're looking at from a, from a software development perspective, but also kind of whether they functionally make sense in terms of, like, what signals and which features you're pulling out of um, your data. So there's, you know, several pieces of information that you're trying to to extract, and there are several assessments that are involved in this study. You know, you, you described that there were voice assessments and there were motor assessments, and that kind of requires different kinds of, of libraries to, to do this. Um, and to make sure that not only are do, this, do the assessments and, and the features make sense, but also are they relevant to the disease? Um, are they relevant to the behaviors that you're trying to look at? Um, are there is there anything else that you kind of think the audience should know about kind of feature engineering, and it's kind of like a major data development area um, in this pipeline. I mean, maybe the only other thing that I would say is that, that something I think is, is important to me, as well as many other people, is some, some transparent link between those features that you derive and, and actual features of the disease, or something that's, that's interpretable you know, in reality, biomechanically. So being able to say, rather than you know, if you just ran machine learning on the raw data, you might find some features that are very, very sensitive to change or response to treatment. But it's hard to interpret exactly what those mean to the reality of a person living with Parkinson's disease. And oftentimes we'll use what are called heuristic algorithms to, to do some signal processing and derive things that are readily interpretable biomechanically or in the context of a disease so that we can actually label them with meaning. So step length has meaning, and it's something that we can derive directly. So I think at least at this stage, while we're still trying to figure this stuff out, there's the, at least my bias is to try and do things that are transparently related or drive features that are transparently related to aspects of the disease because it's, it's really the only way that they will help us interpret that disease and its change over time or its response to a treatment. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been discussing uh, quite a bit um, some of the work that we've been collaborating on, to kind of describing the, the method that you were just talking about. Um, some of the work that we've been doing internally and in, in analyzing some of this data, and we were finding that we were able to generate over 3,600 features from all the assessments that were included in WatchPD. And we found that 40% of those features were selective for, for PD status, um, meaning that they were showed significant differences in the, in the patient's relative to the control group that was involved. Um, so what can you kind of help the audience understand in terms of kind of the what this kind of means and help them interpret these kind of numbers? Yeah, I mean, the, the short of it is that it means that 40% of those 3,600 features that you derived are, are predictive of Parkinson's so that they're able to differentiate someone with Parkinson's versus a, a volunteer who does not have Parkinson's disease, which is important, I mean, especially in a diagnostic context, but it's also important in our ability to interpret some of the signals that we see in the context of a clinical trial. I mean, really understanding what the, the normative state 
of a person is, helps us better understand when things start to go wrong, what are the important things to measure, what are the things that are common to, to normal aging versus things that are, are specific to something like Parkinson's disease. So I think a key point here is that from all of those, so all of those tests were, were put into this study with the thinking that they would be able to differentiate PD patients from uh, a volunteer who did not have PD. But obviously, not all of them differentiate. And what's important is trying to do some volume reduction to figure out first which, which features are most sensitive to you know, specific aspects of PD. But then going beyond that, are there some that are, are better in a given context of use than others? So for example, some, some of those 40% of features may be better in the context of, of diagnosis. Some of those features may be better in the context of monitoring progression or response to a specific treatment. And it's really trying to go from these 3,600 features that you derive from, from the data that you had analyzed to something that became increasingly more meaningful, pared down so that we could be a lot more focused when we start doing the same kind of work you know, in the next trial or the next observational study. So it's a process of refinement and, and really it's trying to figure out against the backdrop of normal aging and things that are experienced during normal aging, what's actually specific to the disorder that you're trying to measure. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, and so just to follow up on that, we did evaluate, you know, which features were consistently selective for PD status and some of the work that we were doing. And uh, as you suggested, there are kind of a core set that are predictive of not only PD status, but also um, progression. And sometimes those features are similar and sometimes they are different. And so that's really important for kind of developing your study design and, and how you want to think about which features to include in, in your study. So great context. So following kind of feature extraction, we're generating all of this data. Um, you then want to proceed to kind of modeling and determining which constellation of features are really kind of important. Um, and this generally involves data modeling. Can you kind of give the audience some insight um, into kind of things that need to be considered in terms of model development and kind of what you're looking at uh, to, to better understand these features and how they map onto different disease states? Well, actually, like, I, I am probably not the right person to ask about that particular. I mean, you, you may be better positioned to answer that, David. I, you, sh you should actually just take this one. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, once we once we generate all the features that um, we needed to from all of the data and had a sense of whether they were kind of relevant related to PD status or not, um, the next goal was to develop a rigorous method for determining whether these are actually related um, together uh, to, to Parkinson's disease. And there's several steps that are involved. Um, one, you want to make sure that your data uh, is independent. You want to make sure that you know you're, it's not telling you the same thing. Um, so you want to make sure you're essentially eliminating what's called multicollinearity um, when you're modeling. So that involves re data reduction, data and feature selection. I'm um, using things like principal component analysis um, or just using some simple regression to identify kind of which features are most selective for um, whatever your outcome is that you're interested in looking at. Um, then once you kind of complete that phase, uh, then you have kind of this core set of, of information that you've selected from, from your featured, your, engin your engineered features. Um, and then you have to select the model and model selection will depend on kind of the outcome measure you're looking at. Um, you know, whether it's a binary outcome or whether it's categorical or continuous in the distribution of the data. Um, and so there's a lot of things that go into um, this decision making. And in this case, uh, we decided that logistic regression was a great start um, just because we're looking at whether somebody has PD status or not. Um, and so then, uh, you know, you develop a model, uh, you pull out the co uh, coefficients that tell you kind of how each feature maps onto your outcome measure. Um, then you make predictions about um, whether uh, an independent data set and um, whether your predictions are accurate or not um, in the independent data set. So you're training on uh, a core set of data and then you're testing on a separate set of data that's been held out. And in this case, we found that um, we are, our model is able to achieve 85% accuracy um, across all patients. So that means that uh, when we looked at whether, regardless of whether somebody had um, was in the Parkinson's group or in the control group, um, we were able to find that the model was able to predict their status 85% of the time correctly. 
And then when we kind of dig deeper into that, we can look at things like sensitivity and specificity, which tells us, you know, if we're looking only at Parkinson's patients, um, how accurate is the model of predicting if they have Parkinson's or not? And that kind of tells us sensitivity, and we had 83% sensitivity. Um, then we uh, looked at our healthy controls, um, how accurate were we in detecting kind of their status? Um, that's specificity, and we were able to achieve 86% specificity. Um, and so we thought that these were overall pretty good numbers. Um, we're, gener we're developing new models um, that are, are kind of extending beyond logistic regression, um, looking at things like random forest, and we're really excited about the results that we're seeing there. Um, and so like, there's, there's definitely a, a, a whole pipeline involved um, from going from the raw data that you had just described um, to some results that can be summarized and interpretable um, for clinicians or researchers um, or scientists. And so when we talk about like 85% accuracy, um, to you, like what does that mean in terms of the kind of the current diagnostic standards um, in clinics for, for detecting early PD patients? So what I would say is that based on, on this result, I mean, really the way that this was set up was we had already screened the patients into this study, including using DADSCAN to, to give us the best shot that these individuals were, were people with Parkinson's disease and, and not a similar movement disorder. So you know, what, what you're presenting here is really something that's taken you know, following that part. So we'd already, we already were fairly certain that the individuals that we had enrolled into the study actually had Parkinson's disease. And you're basically mapping that against the, the volunteers who did not have Parkinson's disease, who are also part of this study, sort of the comparison group. And this is what this basically says is that you have 85% accuracy, putting everything together to, to basically say that an individual has Parkinson's versus does not have Parkinson's disease. I mean, the core of it is that. I think what I, what I would also say is that this approach is typically what we would use in assessing diagnosis or if we wanted to use these for patient selection into a research study or clinical trial. So I think what you have here is basically saying that, that these tests or the features you've derived from those tests are 85% accurate at predicting that an individual will have Parkinson's disease. And that's probably slightly better, at least based on the data we collected here, than the MDS UPDRS, where there's about a 25% overlap on at least you know, certain elements of the MDS UPDRS, especially some of the you know, part one, part two items. So I'd say this is probably slightly better than what we get with the UPDRS, but I guess what I would task you, you guys with would be doing this further in time. Definitely can't do it as part of the Watch PD study, but doing this more during the screening process to understand whether these same features that can identify patients who are already verified to have Parkinson's disease, whether they can, can similarly identify people who we don't know if they actually have Parkinson's disease, because it could be a pretty big deal. I mean, it could get us around using more invasive or expensive techniques like that scan if we knew that there were behavioral markers that were really closer to the functions and the experiences of people living with PD that would be just as good, if not better, than what we're currently using to go through that process. Yeah, yeah, it's a great idea it's for screening. Then also, you know, we obviously want to be able to scale this to other studies um, making sure that it's kind of a robust model, um, able to predict status in other, in other groups, um, other studies. Um, and also, you know, this could be helpful for, you know, surveillance. Um, I think if you're able to kind of track these passive measurements in, in patients and get a sense of whether they may be um, approaching uh, the kind of symptomatology that describes early PD or prodromal PD, um, that seems like it be, could be potentially valuable as well. Yeah, and actually to that point, I, maybe what I would add to that is that, that you know, what it would take for, for that is different than what it takes for doing something around more the identification piece or the diagnostic piece. And there what we may care about is how individual features track progression of the disease or track a response to treatment over time because what we'd really want to be able to say is it's, it's less about overall sensitivity in identifying an individual with Parkinson's disease. And it's more about identifying those features of Parkinson's disease that are most likely to show a signal or a response to treatment or the ones that are most likely to degrade over time. Yeah, yeah definitely. All right, so in, earlier you had mentioned that in the Watch PD design, um, patients were completing assessments both in clinic um, and at home. And so we uh, 
took a look at the relationship between those data. Um, we wanted to determine whether, perform whether uh, performance in clinic was related to performance at home. Um, and we found that essentially we were able to get a reliability score of greater than 0.77 for all the assessments that we were looking at. And um, many of them were above 0.9. Um, and so at the kind of the lowest end of that scale, uh, we were about 28% above threshold for what would be considered relevant, which is, you know, reliability above 0.6. Um, so can you kind of give some context for what that means for you in terms of future study designs um, and confidence in these measurements and how you know, external variability that's involved when people are completing assessments at home, how that kind of plays into this and, and kind of expand on that? Yeah, so just, just briefly, I mean, you know, the reliability you're, you're showing here is, is pretty good. And what I would say is, is what I would be most interested in is you know, what's, the, what's the flip side of this? The, the 0.23 percent that, that you know, causes this to be less reliable because those are brought likely due to sources of variability that, that are different. You know, there's there's variability between a clinic setting and an at-home setting, and there have been some reports about some of those sources of variability. But there are a lot when it comes to using these types of tools to measure in a home setting where things are really unconstrained and uncontrolled, and a, and a person may be administering these tests themselves versus something that's completed under supervision in a clinical setting. And I mean, things from, from the orientations of the sensors to people's motivation to actually do the tasks, do them well, or do them in the way that they would typically do them in a clinic versus a home setting. I think trying to identify where those sources of variability are is really the most important part, because if we can figure that part of it out, then that helps you know, it influences all of our future experimental designs, and it can lead us to a point where we're getting more robust information. I guess what I would also say is there may be certain things that really are outside of our control, and it goes back to what I was talking about before. Say differences in motivation in a home setting where you're doing this maybe once a week or once a day versus coming into a clinic, or differences in fatigue after a full day at the clinic, you know, going through a two-minute walking test may just look different than if you're in a home setting where you, know, you may have just gotten up off the couch to perform your two-minute walking test. So I really think just trying to drill down on, on what sources of variability are the most important is probably the key thing that will help us improve this number, but there may be no way to ever get there to be perfect concordance, and we may not want it because we may want to measure things in different contexts so that we can derive different types of information in those two different contexts. Yep. Yeah, that's a great point. So, you know, people in, in the wild, as we call it, you know, they are engaged in all kinds of behaviors, and sometimes that's where you get the most information out of them. Um, because they're engaged in activities that they would typically be performing and not under these kind of, kind of constraints. Um, but then on the flip side, you know, we are able to reliably um, predict their performance at home based on clinic performance, which I think is interesting. And being involved in clinical trials uh, myself and kind of administering assessments, you kind of feel that you have more control over 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 kind of the environment um, and you're more confident in the, in the measurements. So I think for me, it, this is kind of a great start. Um, and I'm really looking forward to kind of improving, not necessarily the constraints at home, but better understanding behavior at home so that we can account for that when we're kind of looking at this, this data. All right, so we're kind of wrapping up here. We've talked a lot about kind of the current future landscape of clinical trials in Parkinson's disease. And you shared your insights in the digital health revolution, and we've discussed the Watch PD study as a cornerstone to this effort. This feels very much uh, in its infancy still, um, so there's still a lot of next steps to think about. So from your perspective, what are some kind of big picture items that you think the audience should take away um, from kind of the discussion that we've had and also kind of the future that they should be looking forward to? Yeah, I suppose one, one thing is that this work is not easy, and something that I've experienced a lot is that over the years, it's, it's deceptively simple to think you can just put a wearable device on somebody and get good data back, but that is absolutely not the case. And even in a, a field like PD, where we've been doing this kind of, quote, digital work for a very long time, there's still a lot of stuff that, that we don't know, and getting it right, I think, is the important part. So we know quite a bit. Now it's a matter of actually refining that. And I think this is what's probably going to happen over the next five years or so. So none of this is short term. And in the way, maybe the way to think about it generally is that digital is, is becoming its own sort of, of field. And any scientific field in its infancy is, is it takes baby steps. But over time, there's, things start to snowball. 
I mean, it becomes standards. People start aligning. People are more open about their things they're doing. You kind of converge on the important things to measure, how to measure them. So I think we're getting there now, but I, I do want to emphasize that none of this is going to be fast, and it's definitely not easy. I mean, being in the middle of it has not been easy at all. But I do think, especially in PD, we're making pretty big strides forward, and, and I think you'll see increasingly these sorts of tools that we talked about today being used more and more during our clinical research, during clinical trials, really to supplement what we're already collecting and really just try to get a better understanding of the patient and a better understanding of how they're responding to, to what I will hope will be successful treatments that will be coming in the next few years. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, so as part of that, you know, you have to think about regulatory approval and, and making sure that these assessments and the, the endpoints are are valid and, and approved for use in clinical trials. Um, I think that you've thought a bit about how you want to incorporate these measurements um, into you know, other clinical trials. Can you give some insight into kind of what that process is and what other researchers can expect um, for, for putting these kinds of measurements in their, in their trials? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it kind of goes back to what I said. I mean, if this is a takeaway for people who would want to put these tools into their trials, just know that it's not completely easy, but also know that, that we're trying to do things that, that facilitate us all getting better data back in the future. I think when we think about how these tools are used, I think there are multiple places where things can go. And one end of the spectrum, a lot of the things that we've talked about today, a lot of the things that we're measuring in the Watch PD study, a lot of the things that we may measure using digital tools in a trial setting are things that are a lot closer to biomarkers. So they're things that are really measuring the signs of the disease so that, that could be very sensitive, they're very granular, but they may be detached from the actual experiences of the patients. And so the whole other end of the spectrum of this is trying to get measures that are closer to the things that, that the patient actually cares about, and being able to better measure those things in their real environment. And I think those are the two ends of the spectrum. And I think that more granular side is going to be important for us, especially as we have more drug candidates advancing into phase two studies, where you're looking for proof of concept, looking for signals as to whether the, the treatment is actually doing something. They may be our best bet to speed up that process, reduce the cycle times, but they're unlikely to really have, have you know, downstream impact like in a phase three. So what I don't see happening is having like an in-clinic motor exam or some very granular at-home tasks that mirror some of the things that we would do during an in-clinic motor exam being something that would support a primary endpoint in a registrational study, and, and for good reason. On the other end of the spectrum, as I mentioned, there are things that are a lot closer to, to things that a, that a person with Parkinson's or, or patients in general experience. And if we use the, the example of gait, we can derive very granular gait metrics through a two-minute walking test, but that might not be the thing that actually maps to things that a, that a person cares about. And what we might do is use a really similar approach from a data collection standpoint, but then in this case, maybe in a home setting continuously to understand general mobility. So using this sensor basically in the same location, probably not during a structured task in this case, but more free living behavior, we could look at aspects of gait. So how often are people getting up? How long are they able to walk for? Going beyond that, looking at things like GPS, looking at their life space mobility, they're getting up more in their house, walking around more, does that lead to them leaving the house more for longer periods of time? Sort of an indicator of whether they're getting some of their, their you know, freedom back, their life back because of the treatment. And those are the things that we really care about. And I could see those being really useful supplements in registrational trials because they give us information that, that other than, than you know, patients recalling how their function has been over the last month or three months through a patient reported outcome, it's really data that we're not catching, and we're not catching it with the granularity that we may want to support whether a treatment is actually fundamentally changing how an individual with Parkinson's or really any other disorder where we're measuring with, with digital tools is actually impacting their lives. Yeah. Sounds like some really uh, innovative steps that uh, we can take forward in terms of kind of better understanding behavior that isn't captured in clinic. Um, anything else that you feel that uh, Kind of innovative next steps that you're kind of thinking in this field um, in digital health and PD or that the audience may want to know about? Like, what's what's exciting? Well, in, in general, uh, the sort of the same the same open mentality. So being able to, to share methodologies, share data, the things that have been happening increasingly in academic settings, 
and some of which have come through sort of mandating, but, but a lot of it was happening even before that. And that's pretty exciting because it leads to, to being able to actually replicate things, standardize things, figure out which measurements are most robust, how to measure things. We're not all trying to figure it out on our own. And that's starting to, to come more into this, the, the, what has traditionally been a pretty secretive place in pharmaceutical development. And I think once that happens, that's the exciting thing to me because then we can see those same sorts of, of gains, going beyond incremental gains and making actual strides because we're all kind of on the same playing field, talking to each other, aligning, and really trying to find the best solution for measuring individuals in the context of our clinical trials. So I think what, what I would say to anybody that's watching this is, you know, be as open as possible and try to make sure that whatever organization you're part of is open about the work that you're doing because it's really the only way that I see any of this moving forward and being you know, more than like a curiosity or an exploratory endpoint in a, in a clinical trial or research study. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. You know, we made great strides uh, during COVID and kind of everybody coming together and trying to identify mechanisms of action and developing vaccines. And it was really... Uh, inspiring to see everybody working together to do that. And I, you know, just imagine what could be done in this space in Parkinson's disease and what we could do if, if there were more sharing involved, like you just described. It's pretty exciting. Um, all right, well, that wraps up our session. Um, and I think we'll proceed to Q&A. Okay, awesome. Um, seriously, David and Josh, great stuff, guys. Um, and we've, you know, we've got a short amount of time here, so I'm going to try to get us rolling into questions just real quick. Um, so let's see, I've got a ton here. Let's start kind of towards the beginning here. Um, first question, uh, can you speak to effective algorithms with uh, actigraphy or accel accelerometry? Um, for reducing noise and better distinguishing between different aspects of PD, such as standing, gait, sitting, rising, sleeping, et cetera? Yeah, sure, I can, I can take that. Um, so the algorithms that we're using for um, filtering out noise are kind of filters um, that uh, we would use just to process in. I mean, that's just to get rid of any kind of high or low frequency noise, and they may be in the signal generated by um, erratic movement or, you know, dropping the device. Um, really want to get rid of the signal altogether. Um, and then for your second question, uh, for determining whether, um, what states, the behavioral states the person is engaged in. Um, in that case, we have a set of active tasks that these people are completing. Um, and so we know exactly what they're doing during those tasks. Um, but I think to kind of get to the broader question that you may be asking um, is that we can use the data from those active tasks that have very specific labels to them, make predictions about what the participant might be engaging in um, when we're passively reporting them. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of what we're focusing on right now in terms of predicting states uh, in the moment. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, let's see. So let me get through this list here. Another one we've got. So this one they said uh, PD watch. So in reference to that, um, to what clinical assessments are you anchoring these subtle digital measures in early PD? Part three is too insensitive. Part two is also not sensitive in early PD. So I, I can take that. Um, I mean, at least at least the, you know, the way that we would traditionally approach this and have is that even in early PD, we are anchoring to the core clinical scales, and you know there is there is enough spread and severity that we can use those as I guess the way to think of it is kind of a sanity check. And you would expect that within certain domains that we're measuring with the digital tool, to the extent that those domains are reflected in, say, the part three motor exam or the part two, we are looking at those relationships. In some cases, there's, I guess, uh, there's, there's a greater preponderance of given features in certain domains versus others. So for example, bradykinesia 
where you have a significant part of the part three motor exams devoted to measuring bradykinesia body-wide, so upper limbs, lower limbs, the body there, as you could expect, there would be more spread. That also happens to be an area where we know that even early in the disease course, that that, that feature exists. And so we do, we do have the ability to look at those relationships, but we don't stop there. And in many cases in cross-section, that's kind of all we have or a comparison to healthy volunteers. For longitudinal studies, like where we're really focused now, we'd use these tools in drug development, like in a phase two in a disease modifying trial. There we care about change over time. And, and to some extent, you, you don't necessarily need to anchor to anything but the expected change over time, or in the case where you have a, a treatment, especially when it's effective, being able to look at the ability to pick up on a treatment effect. So I guess to answer that question, we, we, we have what we have. The MDSU-PDRS in, in certain respects operates as a reasonably good anchor for what we're trying to do. But when the goal is to better measure progression or response to treatment, those you know, there, there's not necessarily an anchor there. I mean, there's face validity to what we're measuring. And so we're fairly confident that, that what we're measuring is bradykinesia or tremor. But then on the other end, if what we're focused on is measuring response to treatment or longitudinal change, those are things that, that we could sort of treat independently of an MDSU PDRS and, and almost look at that alongside various digital measures to see how well those, those various measures, including our standard scales, are able to pick up that progression or treatment effect. So there's a lot more to, to say on this, but that's generally, generally speaking, how we've approached it and probably how most of us will approach it, at least in this context going forward. Okay, great, thanks, Josh. Um, I've got, let's see, we've got a few more here along similar lines. Uh, so here's a, let's see, here's a, here's a good one. So what are the next steps for validating this work? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So this, uh, this analysis, this study, it was focused on early PD pa uh, patients. And as Josh mentioned, you know, the next step is looking at progression. Um, and I'll also note that uh, there's, you know, a whole range of, of severities that we would need to look at. So although this model has been trained um, and has shown, you know, good, uh, good accuracy and sensitivity and specificity um, in early PD, we want to determine whether it will extrapolate um, to, uh, you know, later stage disease. And given that it's sensitive to these, you know, potentially preclinical measures of, of motor dysfunction in these patients, um, we suspect that these same features are going to be um, even more robust in, in predicting status um, in later stage disease. But that's to be determined. So, you know, we need to get our hands on, on, some, on some data and further collaboration um, to be able to do that. Uh, and also to be able to, um, you know, look at whether it's predicting progression as well. And it's definitely the case that we wouldn't expect the same features would predict um, progression versus differences in severity. And so we're looking forward to working with our, our colleagues and collaborators to further dig into the, kind of that analytic side of things. Um, I would also say that one of the interesting things that we're, that we're looking at is whether we can predict changes in progression or changes in status or just status in general um, at home by looking at uh, clinic-based measurements. So the idea would be, you know, can we have somebody come into the clinic once and can we reliably track their progression over time at home over an extended period of time, you know, less frequently than the six month um, visit interval, which is, which is. So I think that um, that would introduce, you know, a lot of, that would open up a lot of clinic time um, and get, you know, a chance to study more patients and, you know, rapidly develop uh, some of the therapeutics that, you know. Um, and so then finally, you know, we have to make sure that this is, you know, it's, these are approved digital endpoints that can be used in, in further clinical trials. So um, getting them approved, uh, pushing them through that process, um, including them as primary endpoints in the study is, uh, I, I think that there's, there's a bit of a road ahead of us, but I think that we're really excited with these initial results and, and what they mean for for digital measures and Parkinson's. And maybe I could add, since we've got about two minutes left, I mean, the, the other end of this is that, the, as I mentioned during the talk, the development part is not easy. And, and the approach that, that we have, 
at least over the last three or four years, tried to take as, as a larger field, at least on the sponsor and academic side, has been trying to pull people together who do this kind of work in our clinical trials, in research studies, in an academic lab setting, so that we're all sharing information because we, we could all run 50 different validation studies that all get kind of at the same thing, but aren't uniform in terms of the way the data are collected, process, the algorithms we use, how those are optimized. And what we've really been trying to do is pull as many people who do this work in as possible so that moving forward, the work is done in an aligned way. So we're not kind of, you know, bifurcating or going in 20 different directions. We're, we're taking now as the opportunity because things are better established in Parkinson's than almost any other area where we use digital tools to try and take stock of where we are, pull things together and chart out a roadmap for the next five years. We're all kind of following the same path instead of going in every direction because as you know, the faster we can get to that sort of alignment, that's that's something that's worked in other scientific fields and other domains, and we're trying to get there for digital and PD, and hopefully applying that same sort of approach to other areas of need going forward. But I, I can't emphasize enough how, how much it does to facilitate this process by having everybody sharing information and trying to standardize and using common approaches, because I don't see any other way that we can get through in five years to have something that could be very useful for us, especially in the drug development or in clinical research or care, without us all kind of coming together and, and aligning on some standards. So I think that's the last thing I would leave people with is that, that you know, where we're trying to take this is being as open as possible and trying to leverage multiple, many smart people who have worked on this and their learnings so that we don't have to make the same mistakes and we can kind of get there faster than we would if we did it all on our own. All right, and that's a great place to end it. Um, Josh, David, thanks so much. Great conversation, tons of great information. We really appreciate it. Um, audience members, thanks for joining us. We got a ton of great questions still sitting here. Um, I'm going to pass those along to David and Josh uh, to get you guys a potential follow-up on those. And so, you know, we'll make sure to get you some answers to what you've asked. And, you know, thanks for all the great questions. Um, we hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and uh, we will see you next time. Bye, everybody.